So, hey, x hat y hat scalar product with x hat. This is the right product. Now we can also define the left product. The idea is basically the same. This is the right product. So when you multiply this times this, uh, sorry, here I forgot the Vx. Here there is the Vy. Now this is still Vx. Now, if I multiply these two, <coughs> Vx, Txx, x hat dot x hat, one, this x hat still remains, plus x hat, this times this, we have Txy, Vx, x hat, x hat, one, y hat, so here x hat, y hat, T, t x, y hat coefficient zero, here it's coefficient y hat, v x, y hat. So they are different things. And this, so you multiply a vector with a tensor and you obtain a vector. Or you contract, that's the most common terminology because you see here, if you just, uh, what you, uh, I probably had some wrong notation, you are kind of summing one of the ind indices. If you write it explicitly, you will have Txx, Vx, Vx, Txx, Vy, Tyx, Vz, Tzx in this product for the x component. Of course, you can generalize it to, to products of arbitrary number of things. But of course, in that case, you have to specify what are you multiplying this vector with, which index. But basically, tensors, I mean, a vector is a tensor, where you all have only one vector. A scalar is a tensor with no vectors. A rank two tensor is basically pro just two vectors. It's a you can also show it as a matrix. You see, one thing is the property of an object. Tensor is a tensor, it's not a matrix. It's never a matrix. But a rank two tensor of this form, you can show it as a matrix. Similar, let's say. He was asking us, what is a tensor? So for example, we have this dielectric tensor, or the electrical permittivity tensor. There's an example at the end of this chapter with that tens tensor. So I was just telling them that, for example, vectors, you can consider it as a flow in one dimension. Tensors is basically kind of a flow in two dimensions in the sense that, for example, this dielectric tensor, for an electric field in the x direction, it creates a polarization in the y direction. So it takes the x direction and converts it into the y direction. It's three ranked. Hmm? It, uh, it's, it's ranked three, then it has to flow in three directions. Kind of, I mean, you take two directions, you, I don't know, for example, you can say the electric field in one direction, the magnetic field in the other direction, and you create a flow in this other direction. I don't know. Depends on what problem you have. For example, we will see, if we come to that, to electrodynamics, we will uh, consider the energy momentum tensor. We will see that the electric field, electromagnetic field, has a, uh, it has momentum. Let's say, the mo at some point, the momentum can be in this direction. But that momentum can be flowing in, the, in this direction. So it, it flows perpendicular to that one. So here we also have another tensor. It's not weird to have a momentum in this direction and a motion in this direction. You also know it in waves. If you send a wave, 
it will basically have this shape. So this particle over here is oscillating up and down, so its momentum is in the vertical direction, but that momentum is moving in this direction. So a wave transfers momentum. Here you need to describe it as a tensor. The, the velocity of the wave, the direction of the velocity of the wave in this direction. That's a tensor. So it has two directions. OK, so let's give the projector a second chance. It usually close, turns off in two minutes. I don't know. Probably the lamp is getting old. So let's see. OK, this chapter is kind of conceptually, let's say, it's a bit more, comp not conceptually, technically it's a bit more complicated, but also conceptually it's a bit more complicated. One thing is, for example, we are interested in the energy of a dielectric, energy stored in a dielectric. And you see that at the end, you drive this energy for a linear dielectric, at least this is 1 over 2 e dot d. But we also have the other expression for the energy. And this is 1 over 8 pi, sorry. E squared, E cubed r. Well, the right-hand side we derived using the, treating the electric field as the electric field created by the charge distribution. That's, in fact, everything is an electric field created by a charge distribution. Even if you have a dielectric, the dielectric has a charge distribution which creates the electric field. And hence, the energy in the, on the right-hand side can be used for even in dielectrics. But what we obtain is a different expression for the energy stored. And on Monday, I was asking your friends, what's the difference? So we have these two energy expressions. The, the right-hand side is valid for every system. Because it, on the right-hand side, we basically treat it as a system of charges creating an electric field. We calculate the potential energy stored in that system. But in this chapter, we derive the left-hand equation, which is definitely different than the right-hand equation. Now, for example, let's look at this example. It's neutral. There are no charges anywhere. There are no free charges. What's the displacement field? Zero. There are no free charge. The displacement field is zero. So the right-hand side gives me zero. Now, the left-hand side gives me zero. D is equal to zero. But the right-hand side, does it give me zero? Is there an electric field in this one? Yeah. It's full of electric field inside. All the atoms have its internal electric fields. So the electric field is non-zero. In fact, it has a, it will, since the E squared is always positive, it, that integral can never be zero for the system. Yeah, in, in a sense, yeah. But the thing is, what, which one are we really interested in? I mean, I cannot really extract the energy stored in this one without breaking it. But I'm not interested in breaking this one. So what I would really be interested in is if, for example, I bring some charge from outside to this one, put it on this one, how much, en how much work did I do? How much energy did I store by bringing that additional charges on this one. That is what I am actually interested in, not the total energy stored. Because the total energy stored, I cannot extract most of it without breaking my system. The right-hand side is the, end, the work that you have to do to bring all the charges into their final configuration, the bound ones and the free ones. That's the right-hand side. The left-hand side is the energy, uh, that the work that I need to do to bring these additional charges that creates this D field. Okay, so that is the main distinction between these two expressions. So in the, on the left-hand side, we already have this dielectric over here. We don't bring it from infinity. Of course, as we bring other charges, we are modifying this dielectric, creating a polarization. So we also have to take that change in the charge distribution in this one, plus the work that we do to bring the, the charges 
to their final configurations. Those two things we have to take into account. That is what is you that we drive in this uh, in this chapter. Now, the second thing we are, that we are interested in in this chapter are the forces. So we know that if you have a dielectric, if you put some, put it, let's say, in, it in an electric field, or even if there, there is no external electric field, you, you, if you just take some volume over here, there will be some force acting on that volume either due to the polarization of the medium or due to the external electric field or due to the free charges that are over there. Due to the total electric field at that point, you will get some forces acting on it. Now, those forces will be acting on two things. One is the uh, charge density in that volume. Now, if you have some free charges there, they will be filling the electric field. But even if there are no charges over there, you see, the system is, will, becomes polarized, and when, once the system becomes polarized, that polarization, we can treat it as basically as some uh, volume charge and some surface charge on our volume. But those charges due to the polarization will also feel the force. So if you would imagine the force density, that is the force per unit volume, you mainly expect two contributions, one from the free charge density, and plus you also expect another one due to the charges, due to the polarization. They say there will be some term that contains this, uh, the dipole moment of the system and the electric field. Or let's rewrite it in a different form, maybe rho b or surface charge density, sigma b, whichever one is suitable, times the electric field. But you see, the, this rho b or sigma b themselves are proportional to the electric field. Now, they are related with the polarization, which is proportional to the electric field. So you would expect the force per unit volume to contain a part that is linear in the electric field plus another part that is quadratic in the electric field. So this is what you would naively expect, and in the book you see the derivation. But basically those forces are the forces due to the free charge that you put and also due to the polarization of your medium. Now, rather than going over the derivations themselves, I would just rather go over an example, a simple one where we can actually calculate most of this stuff. How long Which one? The second term? Let's see. Let's do an example. Let's look at this example, where we have a capacitor filled with a dielectric. Because we know that if you want to charge a capacitor, eventually we know that the energy stored in a capacitor is always 1 over C, 1 over 2 C delta V squared, which is 1 over 2 Q squared over C. So if we know C, we know the energy stored. So let's start with, let's see how the dielectric modifies the, uh, the capacitance. Well, we know these equal, the two equations that we need to satisfy. One is the divergence of the displacement field should be uh, 4 pi rho f. And the curl of the electric field should be equal to 0. Well, this is basically the Gauss law for d. Furthermore, we know that d is equal to uh, epsilon times e. And in the dielectric, E is just constant in our capacitor. So, hmm? what is 4 pi sigma? Well, E will eventually be 4 pi sigma. That's where I'm trying to reach. 
is equal to, now since epsilon inside the dielectric is constant, this will be just epsilon times del dot E, the divergence of the electric field is equal to 4 pi over epsilon rho f. Well, this just looks like the free case with the, instead of the charge, we have the charge over epsilon. That's the main difference. And if you just apply the Gauss law, you can, okay, outside there will be uh, no electric field and hence no displacement field. In the, in, inside you have uh, the displacement field and the electric field will be non-zero. And if you just solve it, you will see that E, the magnitude, will be sigma over epsilon. 4 pi sigma over epsilon. This is the electric field between the plates. Which is, by the way, E0 over epsilon. E0 being the electric field inside our system in the absence of the dielectric. But since the electric field is modified by a division by epsilon, the potential is also just obtained by division by epsilon for a given charge density. Well, Q is equal to C times delta V or delta <coughs> C is equal to Q over C, Q over delta V, which is epsilon times Q over delta V zero, which is epsilon times C zero. C zero being the capacitance of my capacitor in the absence of this dielectric. So the capacitance is just multiplied by this dielectric constant. And if you don't remember C0, you remember the expression of C0, let's, let's calculate it. Well, we know that E, the magnitude, is 4 pi sigma over epsilon, or 4 pi Q over A times epsilon, ignoring fringing effects. Delta V would be a E times, let's say the height is H. The total area is A, the total charge is Q. The potential difference E times H, so this is 4 pi Q over A epsilon times H. Delta V should be equal to Q over C. So C is equal to 1 over 4 pi a over H C zero. And C is one over four pi A over H times epsilon. <coughs> and from this we can calculate the energy, etc. Now what I'm heading to, what I would like to study is not this simple dielectric but this other dielectric, other uh, simple capacitor, but this other capacitor with partially filled dielectric, not completely filled. <laughs> this is H. And <clears throat> so they say this is the dielectric epsilon. Well, we can even do further We can say, let's say, there are two different dielectrics, epsilon one and epsilon two. If one of them is vacuum, just set epsilon to one. So let's say this area over here, let's call it A1, this area is A2. What's the capacitance of this system? Well, there are different means of solving this problem. <laughs> so this is basically a system of two capacitors connected in parallel. <laughs> this has area A1, this has area A2. This is filled with a dielectric epsilon 1, this is filled with a dielectric epsilon 2. So the total capacitance is just C1 plus C2. And each one we know that, well, let's see, C is 1 over 4 pi. 
they both have the same h. Epsilon 1 over A1 plus epsilon 1 over A2. This will be the total capacitance of my system. Well, let's do it in a, in a different way. We had just shown that the displacement field, well, before we calculated the electric field, which was 4 pi sigma over epsilon. So from which we can just use the displacement field. Displacement field is just 4 pi sigma. There is no epsilon in displacement field. It doesn't really, uh, it indirectly feels the dielectric. So the displacement field in this case will also be 4 pi sigma. Now let's say the magnitude. But the problem is sigmas will be different on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. So let's say on the left-hand side we will have sigma, on the right-hand side we will have sigma prime, or sigma 1, sigma 2. On the left-hand side we have d1, on the right-hand side we have d2, the magnitudes of the displacement fields. So d1 is 4 pi sigma 1, d2 is 4 pi sigma 2. And we know the electric fields, E1. Hmm? Should be equal to E2. Is equal to E2. Basically because, the, remember, the parallel component of the electric field perpendicular to a given surface is always con continuous. So here we have a surface. On the left-hand side, we have E1. On the right-hand side, we have E2. And the electric field, we are assuming that it's almost always vertical. So the electric field is always parallel to this surface. And so E1 should be equal to E2. Which tells me that uh, D1 over epsilon 1 should be equal to D2 over epsilon 2. Or sigma 1 over epsilon 1 should be equal to sigma 2 over epsilon 1, epsilon 2. The presence of the dielectric just uh, causes the charge distribution to redistribute itself. So on close to dielectric 1, we have the charge density sigma 1. Close to the dielectric 2, we have the charge density sigma 2. They will be different. Now, the potential difference, delta V, will be equal to, well, whichever, <coughs> this is E1 times H is the same. E1 is the same whether we are on the left or on the right. And E1 is 4 pi sigma 1 over A, sigma 4 pi sigma 1 over epsilon 1 times H. The capacitance was Q over delta V. So this is 4 pi, now Q over 4 pi sigma 1 over epsilon 1 times H. Now we have to find F sigma 1 in terms of Q if we want to find the capacitance. The capacitance cannot depend on Q. So on one hand, we know that sigma 1 over epsilon 1 is equal to sigma 2 over epsilon 2. This is one relation we have. <laughs> On the other hand, we know that Q is equal to sigma 1 times A1 plus sigma 2 times A2. Sigma 1 times A1 is the char charge close to dielectric 1, and sigma 2 times A2 is the char total charge uh, in the region of dielectric 2. And the total charge is just the sum of these two charges. This is sigma 1, A1. Plus, well, sigma 2 is nothing but epsilon 2 over epsilon 1. Sigma 1 times A2. Or sigma 1 is equal to Q over A1 plus epsilon 2 over epsilon 1 times sigma 1. Oh, sorry. A1. 
A2. Now we know sigma 1 in terms of Q. We can put it in, the, in our expression of the capacitance. C is equal to Q over 4 pi H, Q over uh, epsilon 1 A1 plus epsilon 2 A2. Q's cancel and we end up having epsilon 1 A1 plus epsilon 2 A2 over 4 pi H. Or this is epsilon 1 over 4 pi A1 over H plus epsilon 2 over 4 pi A2 over H. Now, what we had said before, the, the first term is the capacitance of the part that has the dielectric epsilon 1, the first dielectric, and the second term is the capacitance of the part that has this uh, dielectric epsilon 2. I will make an assumption. I will assume that uh, this is the total area. I will imagine I have this parallel plate capacitor. I am inputting a dielectric whose width is equal to the width of the dielectric of the capacitor. So I'm pulling everything in this direction. But this length is L1. This length is L2. So A1 over A2 is equal to L1 over L2. The total length is L. Let me call D the depth of the capacitor. So basically A1 is nothing but A1, L1 times D. A2 is L minus L1 times D. A1 plus A2 will be large L times D. Let's calculate the energy of my system. Well, the energy stored is 1 over 2 C times delta V squared, or, you see, as I insert the dielectric, delta V will be changing. 1 over 2 Q squared over C, but Q will not be changing. Let me just look at this case. I have my capacitor. I'm inserting my dielectric. How much does the energy, the energy stored in the capacitor changes as I change this length L1, as I insert my dielectric more and more? Well, this will be equal to 1 over 2 Q squared, because Q doesn't depend on L1. 1 over 2 doesn't depend on L1. C depends on L1. I have to take its derivative minus 1 over C squared times derivative of C with respect to L, L1. Now C was epsilon 1 over 4 pi. A1 is L1 times D over H plus epsilon 2 over 4 pi. A2 is large L minus L1 times D over H. This is the total capacitance in terms of L1. So we can take the derivative. This is equal to epsilon 1 over 4 pi D over H plus minus epsilon 2 over 4 pi D over H or epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2 over 4 pi D over H.
Well, the appearance of this epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2 kind of makes sense because if epsilon 1 is equal to epsilon 2, as we are sliding this dielectric, nothing really changes. So the, capac the capacitance also shouldn't change. So let's go back to du over dl1. This was equal to 1 over 2 q squared over c squared with a minus sign. Well, this is minus 1, 1 over 2 q squared over c squared times this derivative, epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2 over 4 pi d over h. Now the question, what causes this change in the energy? OK, we know that the energy of the capacitor should change as we are inserting this uh, dielectric, but energy should be conserved. So this energy should be coming from somewhere. Where does it come from? The external force changing the position of the Yeah. <laughs> we have to exert a force on the dielectric so that I mean, we, uh, we don't yet know whether this capacitor is pulling or pushing the uh, dielectric, but apparently it should be ex exerting some force. To balance that force, we have to be exerting some force on the dielectric. So this is our dielectrics, our system. epsilon 1, epsilon 2. Let's say we shift this dielectric by dl1 by acting a force in this direction. So the work that we have done is f times dl1. This is the work that we have done. This should be equal to the change in the energy store because the stored energy is the work that we have done. So if we have done a bit more work, the stored energy will be changed a bit more. But this is nothing but du over dl1 times dl1. So this tells me that f should be equal to du over dl1, which turns out to be this one. Remember, this is the fork that force that we are exerting. Well, the minus sign basically tells me that I have to be exerting the force on the other direction. Well, it depends on epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, of course. Let's say if epsilon 2 is the <coughs> vacuum, epsilon 2 is 1, epsilon 1 will be larger than 1. So epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2 is larger than 0, so the force is negative. So that would just tell me, as I said, I have to be exerting a force in the other direction. So the capacitor tries to pull in the dielectric. And to balance that, we have to be trying to push it out. Now let's look at this force. I would rather study the pressure acting on my dielectric. Remember, the pressure would be the force over area. And the area, well, this area is the area on which the force is acting. And the force is the perpendicular force. Well, the force is in the horizontal direction, so I'm really interested in this vertical area. So what is that area? H times D, yes. This is equal to minus 1 over 2 Q squared over C squared epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2 over 4 pi 
d over h times 1 over d times h. Well, these cancel. Minus 1 over 2. Remember, q over c is nothing but delta v over h squared 1 over 8 pi. Well, that minus sign, I still keep it just to denote the sign. I mean, the pressure is always defined to be a positive quantity. Because you calculate the component of the force perpendicular to the direction of the area, the magnitude of it divided by the area, that is your pressure. So by definition, pressure is always positive. Well, what is delta V over H? Hmm? E. This should be the expression in the book. Well, now let me ask you this question. What creates this force? This is the force act, this is the pressure acting on my dielectric. So there is a force acting on my dielectric. What is creating that force? Let me just take one dielectric. back to your question, you said that the uh, force doesn't depend on this area, on the direction of the electric field, this force, E squared. Well, you see, the electric field is in the vertical direction, but nevertheless, we obtain the force in the horizontal direction. So microscopically, what's creating this force? Basically, as you said, it's the fringing effects. There are two places where we have these fringing effects, though. Not just at the end of the capacitor. We also have fringing effects over here. And also over here. Although we started by assuming that the electric field is in the vertical direction, the fringing fields will not be in the vertical direction and hence they will still be able to create some horizontal force. But when you are calculating the total electric field, total energy stored in your system, or let's say, well, the fringing effects are limited to very small regions. So the energy is dominantly determined by the, uh, by the regions where you don't have this uh, fringing effects. And so your approximation of vertical electric field lines will work. But nevertheless, the forces that we obtain are due to the fringing effects. And the relation between the fields in the non-fringing regions and the fringing regions are mainly due to the, I mean, our theories, our derivations has to be consistent all around. The fringing effects are unavoidable to be consistent. Although their contribution will be uh, negligible in certain quantities like the total energy stored in the capacitor, nevertheless, the consistency demands that the, uh, somehow the influence of the fringing effects is related to the uh, total energy of the system also. Near the interface of the dielectric, well, I would expect them to have uh, something of this shape. Here they will be vertical. On 
from the edges, they will not be so vertical. You see, if you just divide it into two capacitors, one with a dielectric, the other without the dielectric, the one with the dielectric will have slightly less electric field. Inside the dielectric, the electric field is smaller. Inside the dielectric, the electric field is smaller. The displacement field is the same, but the electric field is... Hmm? Sure, sure, sure. I mean, yeah, I agree. In, yeah. Uh, okay, so let's think about it again. So the electric field will be larger on the left hand side. There will be. So in the dielectric, the electric field will be the same. What about the perpendicular component? Perpendicular to the surface, that should be discontinuous. But nevertheless, I expect this form. Yeah. Yes. There should be some perpendicular component due to polarization. Well, this is what I expect. Also, our result on the forces tell us that this should be the form of the electric field. So you see, on this surf, on this point, there is slight polarization still. The electric field is in this direction. So there will be accumulation of negative charges there. Why is the field well, the electric field is always tangent to the electric field lines. Why is the field line? on, on the axis. Well, the force is in that direction. <coughs> but at, at the moment, I cannot come up with a simple answer that the electric field line should be in that direction. But from the result that the force should be in that direction, this is the direction that the electric field line should be. So this will, there will be a force acting in this direction, and on this point there will be a force acting in this direction, so the resultant force will be toward the inside. Now it's easier to see on the edge of the capacitor because due to the fringing effects, the uh, electric field lines will have this form. And again, this, at this point there will be a force in that region acting pushing the capacitor in this direction. At this point also there will be a force in this direction. <coughs> and hence, both from the edge of the capacitor and also from this interface, there will be some force pushing the dielectric into my region. And that force is not in the direction of the electric field itself. In this example, at least, it's perpendicular. Just like in this example, in general, you see, it depends on the difference in the uh, dielectric uh, constants of, this two, of the two medium. The pressure turns out to be always proportional to the derivative of this dielectric constant, basically determined by the direction of this dielectric constant, not of the electric field. tend to agree with you. So your friend is saying that this is not correct, these field lines. If we would actually solve the problem, then your friend says that the electric fields, well, you see, here we have sigma 1, here we have sigma 2. 
or if this is vacuum, we know that sigma 1 over epsilon 1 should be equal to sigma 2 over epsilon 2, which is just 1. So sigma 1 is larger than sigma 2. Since sigma 1 is larger than sigma 2, it creates a larger electric field without the influence of the dielectric, of course. Remember, the displacement field is 4 pi sigma, so the electric field in region 1, no. Displacement field in region 1 is 4 pi sigma 1. Electric fields E1 should be equal to E2. This is why we say that sigma 1 is larger. You see, the displacement fields are different. The displacement field in region 1 is not equal to the displacement field in region 2. Because the total electric field, you see, total electric field receives two contributions. One from the sigmas, two from the polarizations. So in region 1, we have the polarization. In region 2, we don't have the polarization. And polarization tends to reduce the electric field. So if you would have, let's say, if the sigmas were equal, okay, forget the dielectric, sigmas are equal, then in region 1 and region 2, we have the same electric field. Okay. Now you fix the charges. You glue them to where they are. You don't let them flow. You put the dielectric. In region 1, the electric field will be smaller than in region 2. Because the dielectric, there will be charges will be moving around, and they will be moving in such a way that they will reduce the electric field in region 1. But the electric field has to be the same in region 1 and region 2, because on, on every boundary, the parallel component, parallel to the surface, is continuous, because the curl of the electric field is always 0. So that basically tells us that sigma 1, and you see what we did, we had this R medium, we put sigma 1, sigma is fixed, we put in the dielectric, when we put the dielectric, the electric field changed, but it cannot change. It should not, I mean, it should be continuous. So the charges basically should flow to the region 1, so that the electric field in both cases will be the same, equal. There is a larger charge, Without the dielectric, it should create a larger electric field. But then we put the dielectric, which lowers the electric field, so that the electric field in both regions are equal. That tells me that the char surface charge density in region 1 should be larger. Well, you see, if it is not infinite, you see, this relation will fail. This relation assumes that all the work that we have done goes into changing the internal energy of the capacitor. But the charges are flowing. If the capacitor has a resistance, some of the work that we have done will go into this resistance. So this will no longer hold in that case.
like that. It's because the guy can basically charge carriers and they have some mass. But yes, of course, things will be more changing. I mean, you see, if the speeds are slower than all the other characteristic speeds, like in our case, as you said, it's the motion of the charges. They have uh, some speed. In that case, we can still speak about electrostatics because the changes, I mean, we are displacing this, uh, moving this dielectric. It's not a static system. We should be moving it very, very slowly to be able to use the uh, expressions that we obtain in statics. But for speed, you have to compare it with something else. So as long as your dielectric is moving much slower than the characteristic speed, the speed of the electron, for example, or the speed of the uh, reshuffling of the charge distribution, the speed of the current, then we are safe in electrostatics. If we move very fast, such that the charge distribution cannot adjust itself, then you have a problem. What was the speed that the charge, what's the speed of the current? You see, the important thing is not how fast the electrons are moving. The important thing is how fast does this surface charge densities adjust themselves. That's quite fast. You see, the actual current running through the wires, the speed of the current, the, the electron, the average speed of the electrons is very slow. A few millimeters per hour or per se, I mean, slow. But the moment that you turn the light on, you see, you push the button, you see the light. That is because basically the moment you push in the button, you create an electric field throughout the wire. And it's not the electrons over here pushing the next electron, it's this electric field that's causing all the electrons to move at the same time. So this, uh, yes, this readjustment of the surface charges will be quite fast. So for most practical cases, our results would still be correct. Of course, if there are resistances, etc., you have to take into account that basically break this approximation. Well, let's, do you want to break or shall we continue? A short break, okay. <laughs>